All right, welcome back. My name is Jesse. I am a professional tutor and business owner in Melbourne. And I also sat the GAMSAT in March early this year uh, and had one of the highest scores in the sitting. And so I've started making videos and things like that, just running through how I kind of prepared for it and also breaking down uh, to provide a lot of free resources for people that are looking to sit it as well and looking to do, do well in it as the competition grows. Uh, and to try and break down some of the financial barriers to, to getting into medicine. Today's one is looking at philosophical texts and reading them from section one. Uh, this is not an area of strength for me, I would say. Uh, this was, section one was definitely my weakest section. I only scored a 61, which I know is still an okay score, but relatively speaking, it's definitely not where my strengths lie. Someone requested that I run through this one. I went through some reading and time management strategies, and so, uh, the philosophical texts are qu quite a tricky one. I do have some ways that I kind of worked through them, which I'll run through in this one. Uh, the idea is that it'll be also about explaining a bit about what the structure of a philosophical text actually is. That often helps in breaking it down and anticipating some of the questions, but it'll be a little bit different to the usual videos. Um, normally I have questions in front of me that I've written and then I kind of break them down and look at how to analyze and and answer them. Um, I won't be doing that in this one. This one will just be general advice based on things that I found worked for me. Uh, and so for this one in particular, take it with a grain of salt. Um, I'm not saying that this is the hard and fast way to, to tackle these particular questions, but hopefully some of it's helpful. So the first thing is what is a philosophical text? So a, a philosophical text is really, in terms of GAMSAT, by the way, not broadly speaking, I'm probably minimizing or reducing down a much broader topic here. But um, in GAMSAT, at least, the philosophical texts are the ones that try to explore, redefine, or break down uh, and analyze the kind of semantic facts about the world. They often involve a lot of sequential questioning, which we'll look at as well. And the idea of them is usually to question the underpinnings of existing knowledge and fact. Uh, to try and understand its foundations as well, which I know that's a little bit kind of top level there. So we'll we'll break that down as we as we go through. So the first thing is we'll break down the features of a philosophical text. The first one is understanding the different structures. So two key types of uh, structures of philosophical texts or argument styles, because all philosophical texts that we get provided in games that are generally speaking making some argument or some kind of persuasive argument about some topic or concept. Um, so you've got abstraction and then you've got specification as the two different types. So abstraction is trying to take many individual little semantic facts, glue them together and put that into a single generalized theory or thesis. So for example, I'll try to explain all of these with analogies and things. If for example, I were to be blindfolded um, and then someone were to swing a tennis ball around a totem pole and I obviously can't see it, but all I can do is take random photos with a camera, um, assuming that the, the tennis ball is in shot every time. Then what I could do afterwards is take all of those individual images of the ball. These are gonna be all of my semantic facts that I know are concrete truths. And then I can kind of put them together and build up my understanding of what the ball's motion must have been. And I can understand that it's going in a circular path, but only because I've taken many, many concrete semantic facts, glued them together into a generalized theory. And so this is the concept of abstraction of fact. The second type is specification. It's the complete opposite. So it's actually the breakdown of an existing theory or a statement and actually then isolating each of its individual foundational facts to try and determine the truthfulness of it. So for example, if I was trying to make the argument that uh, the McDonald's menu is unhealthy, then I might make that statement, but using specification, I would in that text kind of break down that statement into its individual elements. So I might have definitions of what is healthy, what is unhealthy, or how I'm gonna approach it. And then I might also isolate each of the individual items in the menu and maybe even all of the individual nutritional information of each one of those, prove that each of them is unhealthy by semantic fact, and then glue that all back together. The second type then is looking at thought experiments. So thought experiments are just a test or a logical reasoning or testing of a hypothesis with a fictional scenario. And so this is usually used to demonstrate a theory or to demonstrate the practicality of a hypothesis. A perfect example of that is the classic trolley problem, um, which is kind of ethical uh, or moral dilemma where you've got uh, two sets of train tracks and a lever and one train track has five people 
uh, like lying down or tied to the tracks, I think, and then the other has one. And then you, you've got to make the decision on whether to pull the lever and save the five people and kill one person or save one person and kill five. So you don't often get a lot of moral dilemmas in GAMSAT or anything, but this is a good example of a thought experiment. It's not actually happening, but it helps test the, the point or the concept that's being reasoned with. And so in that case, that may be about uh, the sanctity or the value of a life or uh, what is it, you know, looking at the morality of murder or maybe even capital punishment and that kind of thing as well. So the, the next one then is uh, using analogies and metaphors. So breaking them down, analogies are trying to use uh, much more accessible items or objects to help represent something that maybe is a little bit less accessible for the reader. So for example, if I wanted to uh, explain a moral dilemma of capitalism, rather than talking about, say, market labor and the kind of uh, the economics and the societal aspects of it or the, the philosophical aspects of it, um, I might instead decide to use the analogy of a farmer and their animals to try and put forward a point that capitalism or uh, labor under capitalism is a form of exploitation of labor or something like that. And so the idea is that each of the two parties are representative of something that is maybe more complex and therefore makes the, the text a little bit more digestible. This is done a lot in philosophical texts. Uh, the other one is metaphor, which is slightly different. So this is where you're making a direct statement or the, the author is making a direct statement. But again, they're using representation of something tangible to represent something intangible. So a really common example of metaphor uh, in philosophical texts or in creative texts, you might see it as well, is uh, representing emotion because obviously emotion is not physical. You can't touch it or handle it in any way. So a way for the uh, reader to engage with it is to have it uh, represented through metaphor. So a lot of the times things like anger, for example, are represented through something like fire, right? Or um, a lion might be used as an animalism to represent uh, bravery or courage. So qualities and traits, things that we can't touch overall, right? So we often rely on the connotation of the words, which relates to the kind of cultural meaning. Probably one of the, I think the most frequent in GAMSAT texts for philosophical is uh, using sequential questioning. So this basically just involves continually exploring and asking questions in a kind of digressional uh, text format where it doesn't really have a linear form of thinking or a linear contention or thesis. It just kind of keeps diving deeper and deeper into the topic without actually necessarily tying it all back to one overarching thesis. These are the most challenging to kind of understand because they feel like they're detouring a lot. So they're quite difficult to follow. The most important thing is just to look for when they're asking a new question or when they seem to have given up on the discussion of one point. They're starting to now accept it as fact and then move on to the next. That means that they're finished with that discussion and they're moving to the next element of questioning. And that can help kind of segment the text overall. I found I did that a lot. Um, I did have a one of those. There's one in the practice in Acer about questioning uh, the naming of years, why we called something 2009, but then suddenly it switched to 2010 and so on and the inconsistencies. And it seems very digressional, uh, but uh, it does have a line of reasoning, but it's ultimately just finishing up a question, line of questioning and then questioning something new at that point and just exploring basically. So it becomes more discussive than anything else. An example of this would be like, say I wanted to just simply go through a sequential questioning of what is in a name right? Or what is the point of a name? Um, and so I might ask, what is the point of a name? Uh, then the answer might be, it gives identity, or that may come out of the text. The second then is, why do we need identity? Uh, and then that might be, it provides us with stability and assuredness of ourselves. Why do we need that? Um, so then it might be, we're inclined to survival. Why are we inclined to survival? So a lot of it is questioning the why to get a deeper understanding. Um, and so you could just go on and on and on for quite a while um, until you've reached a logical conclusion at some point. It's also done a lot of the time with like primary school students. I see this all the time. I'm sure you did it when you were at school as well. I know as a tutor, like I see a lot of my primary kids um, get given this task and it's quite an interesting one, the five whys, where uh, they start with what it is that they want in life or what it is that makes them happy usually is what the first question is. And then they just have to ask the question why to each of their five answers. And the answer almost always comes back to education or how actually, sorry, they'll ask how, um, and it always comes back to education. 
and then vice versa. So they, it's like creating this link and that's technically a form of philosophical reasoning as well. So it's really just the sequential questioning technique. And then finally is argument by contradiction, which is again, I would say equally the most popular with sequential questioning is um, argument by contradiction. And so this is effectively where you make you make a statement based on the contradictions of the alternative or the opposing view overall. So if there's an inconsistency in the alternative, then therefore your argument must be right. That's the logic behind it. The most common type that I see that is also the most challenging um, is something called uh, reductio ad absurdum, which basically translates from Latin to mean reduction to absurdity. So it's again, technically a form of sequential questioning where you question something so much until there becomes, or till there is an inconsistency that is revealed, right? And then you can go, ah, so therefore my argument is right because there is now an inconsistency in the opposition. So you question the opposition until you reach some level of absurdity or some contradiction. So for example, if someone was to say, I like all animals, uh, then we might question, uh, what does it mean to like an animal? So we kind of set them up by creating a definition or asking for a definition. Uh, and then they might say, oh, well, if I find them pleasant, then I must like them. And then they say, okay, new question. So it's just this constant attacking with questions until you can pinpoint an, an inconsistency. Then the question might be, what's your least favorite animal? And they say, oh, goanna. And then they say, well, why is, why is a goanna your least favorite? And they say, oh, I don't like the scales that they have. You could turn around and be like, huh, so there's the inconsistency. If you don't like the scales, then you mustn't find them pleasant. And if you don't find them pleasant, then you mustn't like goannas. And if you don't like goannas, then you don't like all animals. Therefore, there is an inconsistency in your statement. And that's it. That's the whole structure of it. So it's just like an antagonistic questioning style. And we see this a lot in a lot of the philosophical texts uh, from Gamsat. Obviously, that's just the kind of text structures and formats. But uh, really what we want to be looking at as well is how to effectively read them. So the first thing that I would always do is simplify and summarize the statements or the points that are being made as I went. I would usually just take mental notes. Um, and I talked about this in my kind of time management video for section three, same kind of deal. I wouldn't want to take heavy notes, but I might put down single words that summarize um, the meaning to me. It might just be a mention of the tone and that kind of thing as well. The second thing is I would look out for metaphors and analogies because a lot of the questions relate to a, an understanding or demonstration of the understanding of those metaphors and analogies. The trickier ones are the applications of them that rely on your, your ability to uh, adapt that and apply it in a new, a new setting to see if you've really understood it. Other times it's just about seeing if you can associate the meaning of it. The third thing is looking out for symbolism uh, and connotation as well. So again, these are just commonly targeted in the questions themselves. So wherever I see any symbols that are representing something or attempting to represent something, I'll stop and ask myself, what is that a symbol for? time and I might make a mental note of that. And a lot of the time I, the way that the reasoning is done is through connotation of the words. So we can use connotation of the words uh, to help with understanding the meaning of the text. A lot of philosophical writers will rely on social understandings of words for connotation to create meaning for what they're trying to represent. And then the next one, this is a bit more of a kind of actual strategy or technique itself is dealing with uh, double and triple negatives in statements. So when they say things like not, or they put a negative prefix like un or in, so inaccessible, uh, that kind of thing, or non, that kind of thing as well. Um, they often do this just to make the reading really tricky. I remember in March I had one, it was a cartoon, but it did have like, I think it started off with there were, there were negatives in the cartoon and then the question itself had like four negatives in it. And that was the one that really, really stumped me in section one. Uh, and so the way that I tackle this is I just basically find pairs of negatives and then you just kind of cross them out or ignore them and then reread the sentence. And it usually sorts it out. So we know in like maths, two negatives make a positive. So you can do that same thing with negative statements in a single isolated sentence. So uh, for example, I have a couple written down here. If we had, I do not wish to stop someone from not attending the event. We've got three negatives in there. So we've got, uh, I do not wish. So the first not is um, one of them. Then we've got stop is another negative. And then we've got not attending, which is the third negative. So if I cross out or if I pair the first not with the word stop, and then I reread it, I can get a better understanding of it, right? So it now says, I do wish to uh, and then someone not attending the event. 
So there's no more negative in there. So obviously it doesn't always make grammatical sense, but that would mean that they would be wanting to stop someone from attending the event. The other way to look at it as well is just go with odds and evens. So if there's an odd number of negatives, the overall statement is a negative statement. If there's an even number, they all cancel out and it's overall a positive statement, right? And when I say negative, that would mean something not happening, positive meaning something happening. Even if there's something happening is not a good thing, something happening is always a positive statement. Another type would be, so if we said, I would not think that media is unwilling to not represent the story unfairly. So there's a lot of negatives in that one, right? So we've got not um, unwilling and then not represent and then unfairly. So we've got another negative prefix in there. So because there is four uh, of them overall, it should be a positive statement um, despite all of the confusions in it. And if we knock out all of those words there, so if we remove not uh, remove just the un from unwilling, remove the second not as well, uh, and pair that with un from fairly. So we've got two pairs to cancel out. And it says, I would think that media is willing to represent the story fairly. And then we've got an understanding of it like that. And that really helps kind of break down a lot of the kind of jargon and confusion of the way that a lot of philosophical texts are written. Looking for any kind of passionate statements or exclamations, whenever these are made, usually there's a question relating to them. And if not, then they usually indicate tone really quickly, which helps you understand the, um, or get to the kind of conclusion as to what the position of the author really is. Tone is really, really helpful. Uh, and then finally looking for tonal shift. Um, so whenever they're changing their tune, seem to be changing emotions or their feelings towards something, then I would look out for that and you can help, that can help kind of section up the text as well into pieces. And then I always ask myself, why did I think the tone changed? What were the words that they used or which sentence was it that told me that that was changing the tone? Because that will help me in terms of looking for evidence when the questions come. And then finally, sometimes you get questions that will refer to a specific line of text in the stem. They'll say, you know, line 14 states, blah, 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 blah. And then they'll ask you something about it. Always make sure that you read not just that sentence again, but read the sentence before it and read the sentence after it if you're trying to move quickly, because often the sentences before and after provide that line some context. Um, and so it gives you a deeper understanding of it. So even though they're asking you about the line itself, you may need information from the line previous or the line after um, to help with answering it. There might be some contingency on it. So always make sure you're reading the line before and after. Technically, it could be hidden further back or further forward, but this is just something that I did to uh, prevent myself from having to reread the text a lot. And I could still go back and check for evidence relatively quickly um, without killing my time. So that's, that's it there. Um, hopefully all of that has been helpful, or at least you've been able to take some things from it. Like I said, this is not my area of expertise. So this is just simply a list of things that I kind of put together um, the structural stuff is actual structural analysis of uh, the different types of philosophical texts. Hopefully that helps in understanding what you're being presented with and how to kind of digest it as well. Uh, and the, the steps on how to effectively read them. These are just things that I found I was doing um, and seemed to provide me enough success uh, in it. But uh, there, there may be other things that could be more helpful as well that I'm not at all aware of because I'm more of a section two, section three person. So uh, anyway, hopefully that's all been helpful and uh, I will see you in the next one.